Hey, this is Dr. Chris Kelly, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about how to understand the results from your echocardiogram. Now, an echocardiogram, as I mentioned in a previous video, is an ultrasound of the heart that evaluates the structure and function of your heart, provides a ton of information. It would be impossible in this video to describe every single abnormality that we can encounter and how we follow it up and assess it further. In addition, I should point out that the best source of information is your own doctor, because your doctor can review the results in the context of your overall clinical picture. But if you have a copy of your report and you're just trying to understand the lay of the land and get the basic terms down, this video is for you. So an echocardiogram report will cover uh, the following information in almost all cases. It'll specifically comment on the four different chambers of the heart, the left and right ventricle, as well as the left and right atrium. It'll comment on the four valves within the heart, and it will also comment on the great vessels. They're called great not only because they're fantastic, uh, but because they're really large. They're the main conduits of blood to and away from the heart. You may see a lot of numbers uh, and sort of quantitative information in the report, but somewhere in there should be a qualitative description of each of the items that you see listed here. This is a picture of how it all comes together. So just a brief crash course in heart anatomy. So you have blood coming back from the body through the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, collecting in the right atrium, going through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, getting pumped through the pulmonic valve or pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery to the lungs. In the lungs, blood picks up oxygen and comes back through the pulmonary veins, shown here, and collecting the left atrium. Then passes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart, and gets pumped through the aortic valve into the aorta, which carries it to the entire body. We don't see all of these structures on a standard echocardiogram, uh, but the ones listed on the side here, we, we do see in detail, and they should be commented on specifically. With respect to the ventricles, the pumping chambers of the heart, the report should comment on the size of these uh, chambers, whether they become enlarged or not over time, and there's many reasons that they can become enlarged. The thickness of the walls, so the muscular wall of the chamber, is it a normal thickness or is it have an enlarged thickness, for example, because of long-standing high blood pressure? And then finally, what's the overall function? When the heart beats, when the, the chambers contract, do they contract with normal strength? Do they relax in a normal way and fill in a normal way? And some of the ways that we commonly describe function are shown here. So the ejection fraction is a universal concept in echocardiography reports. The left ventricle will always have a description of the ejection fraction. That's the percentage of blood inside the left ventricle that gets ejected when that ventricle squeezes. And a normal ejection fraction is about 60%. If your ejection fraction is significantly lower than that, say down in the 40, 30, even 20% range, then you would have what we consider heart failure, and that's something that would require close follow-up with your doctor. The diastolic function describes how the heart relaxes and how it fills with blood. And we don't often put a number on that, but we sort of score it as either normal or grade one, two, or three abnormal, so dysfunction. Uh, grade one diastolic dysfunction is pretty common, especially among older adults, people with high blood pressure and other conditions. Grades two and three diastolic dysfunction are less common and a little more serious and something to talk about with your doctor. Uh, next up are the atria. Those are the chambers on the top of the heart that collect blood and then release it into the ventricles. Usually the only comment on the atria that you'll see is the size, whether those are normal in size or they become enlarged with time. Uh, atria can become enlarged if the pressure inside the heart is elevated long term, for example, because of high blood pressure or a valve that's not opening properly or a valve that's leaking too much or a heart that's just not pumping blood well, that can all cause the pressure in the heart to become abnormal and the atria can get stretched out by the increased pressure. Uh, with respect to the valves, each valve should be described in some detail and that detail should include a description of the structure of the valve. Uh, one of the valve structures that um, we perseverate on quite a bit is the aortic valve. In about 99% of the population, the aortic valve has three leaflets, so three little pieces of tissue that come together. Uh, but about 1% of the population has what's called a bicuspid valve, so only two pieces of tissue there. And that's important because bicuspid aortic valves are more likely to have problems later in life, including both stiffness and leakiness. And there's also an association with enlargement of the aorta. So we always try to comment on that if, if we can see it well enough. Sometimes we just can't see it well enough to say for sure if it's tricuspid or bicuspid. 
Each valve will also describe the amount of regurgitation, also known as insufficiency. So this simply means that when the valve closes, does blood leak backwards through it or not? Um, trace insufficiency, mild insufficiency is very common. We see that very frequently. If it's mild, it may require some follow-up over the years, uh, but it's nothing urgent. In contrast, moderate insufficiency is something that requires more close follow-up. They'll probably have another echocardiogram within a year or two. And severe insufficiency requires very close follow-up and, and frequently requires some kind of intervention to fix it. And finally, there's stenosis. So stenosis is kind of the opposite problem. Stenosis means a valve that doesn't open enough, and so blood can't get through it in the normal way. Um, and instead of opening wide like this, it just opens a little bit like this. Um, this is also a, a common problem. If it's just mild stenosis, it usually can be followed up over a few year period. Uh, if it's more moderate stenosis, it requires close follow-up. And if it's severe stenosis, it probably requires an intervention to be fixed. And of note, valves can both be stenotic and regurgitation uh, can occur as well. So it can not open properly and also not close properly. So you get both stenosis and regurgitation. Finally, then there's the great vessels. <clears throat> what we usually see here is a description of the size. So the aorta, for example, is it normal in size or is it enlarged? An enlarged aorta requires careful follow-up to make sure it's not getting excessively enlarged, at which point it might require surgical correction. And then there's pressure. We can't estimate, <clears throat> excuse me, we can't measure pressure directly inside the heart using an ultrasound, but we can estimate it. And you'll see estimates of what the pressure is inside the pulmonary artery, uh, carrying blood away from the heart into the lungs as well as the inferior vena cava, carrying blood into the heart from the uh, lower half of the body. And if the pressure is enlarged, or rather increased in those vessels, that can indicate certain disease conditions. So that's a quick overview of the uh, basic echocardiography report. I hope that's helpful. And as I mentioned, um, for specific abnormalities, so leakiness of specific valves, stenosis of specific valves, sort of the overall progression of that and how it's monitored and what it means, uh, there's separate videos which you can check out, or of course you can talk to your doctor. Thanks.